welcome to episode 22 of the super dangerous show joe how are you uh i'm pretty good uh, i'm still feeling a little under the weather and i had a, a very stressful and hectic uh past couple weeks uh, also feeling unwell during that time so um yeah i don't know i just I'm, I'm on the mend things are looking better it's not going to rain for the next 10 days the birds are outside the sun is shining i think that normalcy is returning to the returning to the world good can you walk again uh yes i was never not able to walk but for a few days i didn't want to okay so let's just put a bit of context there to people listening to this is it okay to disclose a bit of medical stuff yeah that's fine that's fine all right Joe got the COVIDs, the vids, the viddly doos, the vid so the vid. I actually, yes, yes, the vid nineteen. I actually think it would might have actually been the flu vid because flu vid. Oh. Um, yeah, yeah. Apparently, apparently that apparently that's a fun combo. You know, kind of like how how you're not supposed to mix two different cocktails together. Yeah. Um, but uh, just due to the way the whole thing kind of the whole thing kind of kind of played out, <clears throat> it looked as if I may have actually been coming down with the flu. Um, and then that quickly was usurped with the vid. And so for, you know, a, a small number of days, I seemed to have symptoms of both simultaneously, which was really weird and, uh, kind of super annoying, but apparently that's not super, it's not super uncommon because I guess if you're like me and you're a hermit that lives in the side of a hill, uh, up in the forest and you never go out in public, the very limited times you do go into public, you're exposed to all kinds of things. And so wouldn't it just be your luck to get uh, the flu and COVID at the same time? <laughs> Fair play, man. But I'm glad to hear you're getting better. Um, yeah. Did you manage to get the stuff that you planned to sort it out in that time, by the way? I don't even know. I think I no, 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 no. I had, you know, prior to me getting, to me getting sick, I uh, I had really, really massive grandiose plans of getting a whole bunch of my life organized, and some friends were coming to help me do some work on my house, and <clears throat> yeah, there was like thirty items on the checklist, and I think two got done when I was hoping we would get 25 of 30 done, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, it's fine. I'm just glad that I'm feeling better and yeah. And there's 10 beautiful days. I'm going to get the garden going real good. this this coming week. And you know, that's something I think everyone should do. Plant a garden. Everybody plant a garden, a big garden, a giant garden, grow food anywhere you can grow food indoors and in your, in your basement on the you know hood of your car. It doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, grow some food. Yeah, seriously, this is the time to get self-sufficient. Oh God, everything is pricey. <laughs> uh, I am working so much overtime at the moment. I literally sat down, not really sat down. In my mind, I sat down, worked out exactly what my biggest expenses are going to be for the next 12 months and what I'm going to need. And I was like, you know what? Let's just get all of my overtime out of the way in one go. So I am aiming to do 20 night shifts in the next month. I kind of managed to do, well, I'm about to start four. So once I've done these, I'll have done 11 of that. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. so, so you're going to try to front load all of your night shifts for the entire year in like a two month period? Ba basically all the overtime stuff so that basically when it comes down to i can just basically work two two and a half weeks per you know per week sorry two two and a half days per week for the rest of the year after that's the upside or if i pick up extras then you know that there'll be tax implications but I, I can work around it you know what i mean just that the money is there um, because literally my mortgage is going up at an insane rate as interest rate. Okay. Whoa, wait, wait, wait. How, okay. Um, you know, unpack as much of that as you want, but mortgages, at least in my experience, unless you've got like a sketchy balloon are typically fixed. Yes. So, so I made a decision to go onto a variable interest rate after sticking onto a fixed plan for ages, okay. which to be fair at the time the price of eth was like four eight hundred and i was convinced eth was going to 10k and i thought well if it does that 
and I'll just pay this whole thing off in one sure. go. And you know, obviously that's not happened in the last few months. If anything, we're entering recession territory. Query borderline bear market, query borderline consolidation. I don't know what the hell is going on. Long term, I'm still bullish on cryptocurrency, but I kind of have, you know, I made some sort of strategic financial decisions around the anticipated trajectory of the prices of cryptocurrency. And as anyone who is prone to doing that will find out, that's the sort of strategy that can quickly backfire. Fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, not not too bad because I have a shit ton of financial resilience work. With it, I've shut. I have. I have more than enough resilience and reserve to overcome any anticipated challenges. Um, you know, to, to me, just 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 so you know, the concept of budgeting to me is work out the big expenses and then don't have to think about the anything else more. yeah that's that yeah so that's actually how i try to do it but i have a slightly different budgeting strategy my budgeting strategy is don't ever buy a brand new car don't ever <laughs> buy an expensive house and so far it has been not to procreate and so long i, I have found myself being able to resist all manner of financial disaster just because I haven't done those three things. You know, that, that may mean I'm also missing out, but at the same time, um, going into the next, you know, three or f going into the next three to five years of global turmoil, um, I'm thankful for the uh, resilience and the, what's what I'm looking for, you know, anti-fragility of my relatively Spartan existence. Yeah, so I agree with that. I don't have, I have a very nice house, which is not that expensive relative to other UK properties. Yeah. Uh, and to kind of put the perspective here, so we got um, a three-bed duplex in the city center, in a nice part of the city center where I'm effectively a 10-minute walk from every random thing you can name. Like literally, you name it, it's a 10-minute walk or a 15-minute drive. Everything you can do. Um, acro yoga. Huh? Yes, five, 10 minute walk. Really? You can do some yoga in a 10 minute walk, regular yoga in a 10 minute walk. Which yoga did you uh, say? Uh, acro. Acro. What's that one? Uh, acrobatic yoga. You, there's a gymnastic set. Okay. Probably not acrobatic yoga, but there is a gymnastic center within a 10 minute walk. So I guess you could do acrobatic yoga there. Hmm. Hmm. You know, it's probably there. You just don't know about it. <clears throat> what, what about, yeah, yeah. what about uh, Krav Maga? Yes, 10 minute walk. <laughs> That's funny. Naming it, dude. Uh, let's see, what else can I think of? Uh... There is a very fixed spot in Leicester where you're basically 10 <clears throat> minutes from every imaginable activity known to mankind. Well, or 15 minute drive. If you're going to say skydiving, there's an airport within 15 minutes. No, no, no. I was going to say indoor skydiving. Indoor sky. Okay, fine, fine. All right. Not everything, but yeah, yeah, fine. Come on, dudes, build it. Yeah, what, there's a name for that. Those are getting kind of popular here in the States. <clears throat> when I was on a road trip, when I got stranded uh, that I mentioned a few shows ago, I passed by three of those places. It just is like a giant, just a giant, you know, you know, cylinder building. And apparently you uh, skydive inside. And uh, yeah, I would like to try it sometime. Yeah, the, the, there's a center about an hour away from where Lee, we live. I, I think it, it looks fun, but have you have you done real life skydiving? I have not. It's I'm, kinda, I'm kind of scared to actually. So the hardest bit's throwing yourself out the plane. That's yeah, what I can't. I, found. I can't even imagine. It's the plane. The airplane's perfectly good. It's it's it, it, it took off on its own power. It will probably land even with no engine. And why am I abandoning it in the middle of the sky? Exactly. The act of willing yourself to jump, that's the hard bit. But the thing is, or at least when I did it, this was years ago, if you didn't jump, you could never go in that plane again. They would never let you skydive. So it's like, just go. That sounds like something they would just tell you to try to get you to do it for sure. Yeah, yeah, that, that does in retrospect. But it worked and it was so worth it. Um, but my point is, there's all this cool stuff. Um but then I can look and I can find, and this is a weird caveat. If you want to live in a nice fancy apartment outside of London in the UK, 
you can get pr relatively like a third to half of the price of a similar size of or of a similar sized or smaller house so there are like the average you know if this if where we lived was a house with a garden with the equivalent space it would be about three times as much which i find bizarre well that's a massive difference yeah yeah we we went house hunting for a whole year and we literally saw like 20 houses in that time and there were two that I think would have shortlisted to buy at that sort of price range that we were at, which was, you know, three times, you know, the value of our current property. Um, but yeah, the other 18, smaller, crampier, more isolated, kind of boring. I hate saying this. Like if, if you wanted to live like a little suburban life with like a garden and raise some kids, I guess it's okay. But your house, the ho those houses were all, all the rooms were smaller. Everything was crampier. Like that, the quality of life for some reason just didn't match. So we just kind of got put off the idea in the end. Um, the, the housing market in the UK is a really weird, a weird one, and there's lots of conditions. But that's not really what I wanted to talk about today. Just, just but I, I, what I'm trying to say is, completely agree with you. You know, you don't have to get the fanciest or most expensive house and you certainly don't have to get brand new cars you can get very nice secondhand cars you know, i mean um, you know you know i think there's a time for it but you know i've never i've just never i've never woke up i've never woken up one morning and thought to myself you know what i, I think i've made it i think i'm gonna go buy a new car <laughs> you know what i mean and I, I i think it's just one of the one of those things that you're just gonna know and uh, amazingly, though, I've, I think I've also seen a lot of people, quote unquote, think that they knew and then they really suffered from it. And, you know, not only that, but I also remember the 2008, 2009 financial crash. I rem remember it very, very well. And I kind of think that we're going to look at that again or, you know, you know, on, on the on the on the more modest end of the expectation, you know, you know, um, you know, curve, I think that's what we're looking at. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's one of those things where, I mean, this, this is how economic recessions happen, right? People get worried about finances, they quit spending. When you quit spending, you start starving the greater, greater economy of your economic output, and then everything crashes. It's so weird how it's such a, such a cyclical, you know, a, 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 a you know, a repeating cycle. But you see that, that there are legitimate reasons in the UK for people to cut back on their expenses now. So, uh, inflation's gone up and, and what's happened is because of COVID, supply chain disruption means that goods just aren't flowing as freely. So now the UK is, you know, the, the, the number of goods available to import has shrunk drastically, which means the demand with, you know, the same or increasing demand. So, you know, shrinking supply, increase, relatively increasing demand, prices are going up. So this is applying to food, electronics, you know, cars, um, everything. Um, and, and the consequence of that is that, you know, that the cost of living in Britain has, has gone up considerably. So petrol's gone up by, it was a hundred pence per liter a year ago. It's 160, 158 pence per liter is the cheapest now. And there's a 12 month period. Uh, food prices have gone up, I reckon 20% on average. Hmm. Um, and I think the projection is they'll continue to go up. And in the UK, because of stuff to do with Brexit, the the, the, the net GDP, basically, you know, the, the net exports are in a state of decline. Uh, liquidity is in a state of contraction. So people are, and the consequence is exactly what you said. They spend less. The consequence mm -hmm. of spending less is there's even less flow. So there's even less economic output. So everything contracts. Correct. Um. But yeah, that's why we call this episode another day in paradise, brother. <laughs> oh dear, well, I, you've got quite a bit of talking about, quite a bit to talk about. So I say just, 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 just launch in there. Now, well, I, it sounds like a lot, basically looking at, at the subtopic points, but we'll just, we'll just gloss over it. UK police crime sentencing and courts bill 2022, nationalities and borders bill, Panama, Twitter, and Elon Musk versus free speech versus autonomy. Uh, and that those are the salient points that I just wanted to go through. It's been a really fucking busy week, man. 
um well, two weeks in fact since we last did this because obviously you've been knocked out by fluvid um but in that time it just looks like a lot of random shit has happened and oh, you and yeah. i have been discussing this um you know i was pretty bummed out last week much like you have been generally a bit bummed out with fluvid is that a fair thing to say yes i was very bummed out with fluvid yeah I think whilst we have both been respectively bummed out, the world has literally felt like it's collapsing. So in the UK, they pass, they, ha- they have now passed the Policing Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, which pretty much makes any effective protest illegal. They can, you know, I'll, I think we discussed this in an earlier episode months ago, and it was certainly a point of contention, but I'll just read the bit that's really controversial. Yeah, to you. Um, j- just just the name of that bill just is freaking me out. So I'm I'm not liking where this is going. Okay, so let me. Uh, yeah, so this the the the, uh, the bill provisions in the bill will broaden the range of circumstances in which police can impose conditions on protests, including a single person protest to include where noise may cause a significant impact on those in the vicinity or serious disruption to the running of an organization. Uh, The home secretary will have power through secondary legislation to define and give examples of serious disruption to the life of the community and serious disruption to the activities of an organization, which are carried out in the vicinity of any procession, assembly, or one-person protest. Uh, these regulation-making powers will clarify ambiguous cases should they arise. Basically, if you create a protest that's noisy, you are at risk of getting arrested. That's it. If it is creating a nuisance, um, or deem- that's nuisance. terrifying. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's law. That that's a thing that happened. Now now British people can't protest. At a time when their government is being openly exposed to be the most corrupt government in probably a few hundred years, in it, or at least in its recent history. I mean, we are talking really, really large scale abuses of power within government relating to, uh, well, PPE kit. There's loads of scandals about misappropriation of PPE funds and handing out of contracts to buddies without sort of proper tendering processes. There's been a bunch of scandal. Oh man, there, there, there's a, I, you know what? I've lost count. I've actually lost count. And there's been so much stuff that's happened in the UK where the government has been exposed to be nepotistic or corrupt openly. It, there's so many different stories. You can just go, I feel like just Googling UK corruption and you probably just get this endless list. Wow. Um, but basically in the spade of that, you know, uh, yeah, this bill passed, so you can't exactly protest it anymore without the risk of getting arrested. Um, I think that's going to backfire horribly because when you curb people's right to protest, you kind of you remove this buffer zone between you know not extreme and extreme. Uh, and I think people who are genuinely committed to causes are just probably going to not only go out and protest. I think they're probably going to get radicalized. I think this bill will backfire in a lot in a big way based on my understanding of people. So, you know, let her rip. Um, what's the next thing? I mean, nationalities I mean, and borders. Oh, yeah. Do you think that, that that's the plan of this horrible bill? No, I think the plan of this horrible bill is to suppress any form of dissent, which will then allow corruption to perpetuate and nepotism to perpetuate in a hubristic empire that's basically going down the dogs and dying a painful death a liquidity death i might add because they voted for an economic policy brexit which has basically cut off a bunch of their trading routes and has soured a lot of their sort of international relations so i I don't really i don't really care this is the this is the work of small-minded people to me who fundamentally don't believe in freedom uh, who don't believe in democracies, who don't care. Uh, you know, for me, the concept of fascism is a boot on someone's neck, and this law is the equivalent of that. So fuck them. Fuck the UK. Fuck the UK government. I've said it. Um, not Oof. fuck the UK, by the way, but, you know, because there are plenty of nice people, but fuck the conservative government in the UK. 
fuck them to hell. That's it. Uh, I mean, it's one of those things where uh, I forgot what it was. I was reading ages ago, but it was saying something to the effect of, you know, the governments have most of the resources that you could only dream of having in order to try to, in, in an attempt to make one of the most, some of the most informed decisions possible. And when they kind of consistently don't make what we as the proletariat perceive to be the most informed position, decisions possible, the, here's the question. Um, is it incompetence or are they literally getting exactly what they're paying for? <sighs> Um, as in, as in, as in this is the plan, like the plan is actually to make this, you know, grotesque, you know, um, um, power grab and try to do it while everyone else is arguing about, you know, some celebrity court case or something. Well, funnily, you should mention that because whilst this law was passed uh, and another law, the Nationalities and Borders Bill is currently undergoing review in the House of Lords, which, by the way, will allow the UK to strip you of your citizenship, of your British citizenship, if you are a dual nationality without telling you if they think you're a threat to the nation. Um, While those things have passed, uh, everyone in that week was getting bothered about something called Porngate. Uh, a local MP uh, in the House of Commons, Neil Parrish, who has just formally resigned. He was basically caught looking at porn on his mobile phone whilst at work in the House of Commons. So that's what the papers decided to focus on for the whole week while this these two particular bills... Oh my gosh. ...strip your right to protest were passed that effectively give the government the ability to revoke your British citizenship if they want to without notice if you're a deal citizen have been passed so you know that 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 is to me it's it, you know it's all part of the plan look the media is by and large owned by private corporations private corporations are owned by private individuals private individuals have private interests and private interests will s- sort of work to preserve their interests and their interests may not match the interests of the broader public their interests are theirs and that's fine or is it i don't know but all of this stuff follows traditional historical patterns and you know i kind of go back to like synthesis antithesis the galian stuff that i learned as a philosophy student in my teens uh you know cycles of history repeating themselves and you know you know economic look let's put this into perspective why am i pissed off because at the moment um oh fun fact a few weeks ago a patient had arrested had a cardiac arrest it took one hour for an ambulance to arrive to this person's door Uh, so you know one hour before they arrived and then took 20 minutes to get to the hospital so this person had basically been dead for an hour with cpr performed by his loved one you can't I mean, because there's no ambulances because they're all queuing up outside A&E because the hospitals are full because you can't discharge patients from the hospital because there's no care homes to discharge them to because care homes lost 15 percent of their capacity post covid due to the measures they've taken. So now all the hospitals are full. So now patients are waiting 10 hours to be seen in A&Es. This is a national phenomena. So now not only are they waiting 10 hours to be seen, all the ambulances are queuing. So there's no ambulances to serve the community. So everyone is fucked to the point that a director of a NHS trust, when his wife had a stroke, or what yeah he literally drove her to the hospital rather than wait on an ambulance because he was worried it would take too long Oof. this stuff by the way is not national headline stuff this is just stuff that's buried in the back pages because mps are looking at porn on their mobile phones because that's apparently the most important porn. news of the of the year yes <laughs> fuck the uk Sorry. And I don't mean that to the people of the UK. I just mean that to the institutional structures because this whole concept of rule of law, fuck it. Like the whole, yeah. Like, does, is this just what happens with civilization? Does it just, you know, uh, I mean, I mean, you know, here, here. I mean, people are giving the 
fuck up. Do you have any idea how hard it is to staff an A&E right now? They are paying me an insane rate to do these extras. Literally an insane rate. I, if I told you- And you're burning out, by the way. So eventually eventually you will become unhirable at any rate. Well, I mean, here's the deal, right? If the hospitals are that busy, everyone starts burning out, like all the staff, because they're just constantly overworked, on the edge, stressed. So actually we've had, I've seen probably the highest rate of staffing turnover in the department that I've worked in and the highest amount of staff attrition. And we currently have, at least the department that I'm currently in, has got serious recruitment and retention issues. Yeah. Um, because, oh, because, you know, you can't, oh, by the way, the reason why care homes can't increase their st- uh, capacity is because for years they've paid carers minimum wage. So now these carers post lockdown have had some time to rest, recharge, think things, and they're working in the hospitality sector where the wages are better. They're moving yeah. to other jobs in other sectors with better pay and conditions, yep. which is cool. But, you know, fuck the UK. <laughs> I mean, another day in paradise. So what's it going to take? Is it going to take just, just a terrible crash and burn and a complete, you know, you know, re a complete, you know, resinking of like the, the populace's, you know, what's I'm looking for? Just, just everyone's going to have to get shaken out of it. You know, the hard way because the easy Uh way is no longer available. So I'll tell you what, I think there will be, here's my prediction, right? I may be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I think there will be civil unrest in the UK in 12 months. Significant civil unrest. Um, I'm uh, brought upon by what? Huh? Uh, uh, You know, know, brought upon by what? Just everything? Yeah. I mean, look, I'm not poor, but I'm feeling the effect of cost of living. I'm having to think harder. I'm having to work more in advance. Right. And I have a huge buffer and safety net. There are plenty of people in the UK who have significant credit card debts, who have, you know, next to nothing in terms of savings. There has been an increase in the number of food banks in the UK or demand on food banks because people are starving. Because the cost of electricity has gone up 100 percent. My electric bill went up 140 percent, by the way. Yeah, you know, I can I've got the buffer. There are plenty of people before this thing hit who are basically just about getting by. Correct. Just so in the next twelve months, when the full impact of rising interest rates on mortgage fees are going to hit, when the full impact of doubling of electric bills, when the food prices keep going up, when the petrol prices keep going, when people start starving and dying while waiting for ambulances. Um, you're going to just see creeping amounts of civil unrest. And when you start, you know, right, yeah, okay, people will protest and then a bunch will go to jail, but then you're just going to piss even more people off because you've banned the right to protest. So I just feel like this is setting up for something really big later down the line. But but what? Well, like rioting. It just seems like the setup for like rioting. Like, I'm amazed that that the UK media and government isn't more transparent about how bad the state of things are right now. Like, if they were, this whole process would probably accelerate some, but at least there'd be a more open dialogue towards resolution and an aversion of this. People are talking about the cost of living crisis in the UK right now. It is a topic that is undergoing discussion. The current government, I I could throw so many articles about how completely out of touch they are. I mean, one of their minister's suggestions was, oh, when you go to the supermarket, you should just buy value branded goods as opposed to regular branded goods. Um, Another one, Prime Minister, good, good with the Prime Minister on on national TV in an interview. The interviewer gave a story about this 93-year-old who is currently using her free bus pass to spend most of the day sitting on a bus because the bus is heated because she can't afford heating at home. Mm -hmm. So she's warm during the day. And then the prime minister's response was, well, thanks to me, I made those bus passes free. 
which was partly a lie. He just reinstated them being free. So this this is what we've got. <sighs> this is shit. So I've I've been looking over the pond at what's at, at, you know n not just Brit Britain, but you know in particular Poland, in particular, um, um, gosh, pretty much okay. If you have been paying attention to what's happening with energy in Europe, <laughs> it's pretty scary. And, you know, it looks like, it looks like there's a, there's a massive game of game of chicken being played out in slow motion, um, uh, between with some countries choosing to try to, you know, you know, buy, um, you know, Russian fossil fuel with rubles. Some countries are not. And, ah, uh, it's, you know, I think it was, was, a, I think it was Poland that said that they're going to attempt to not buy it. Um, because the, the peak of the heating season is over, which I find interesting, actually, how, you know, this all could have gone, this all could have gone much worse, actually. And I'm just trying to think to myself, was it just dumb luck that, 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 uh, Russia decided to and basically did Russia decide to wait until the peak heating season was over before putting these rest restrictions on just a as as like, you know, a bit of a human humanitarian thing, as crazy as that sounds, or did was it just so ha I mean, because <clears throat> they clearly were not trying to, <clears throat> um, ex you know, exact maximum pain, because if they wanted maximum pain, they would have turned off the pipes a month and a half sooner when when it would have risked freezing millions of people. So, hmm. so now, now what's going to happen is there's going to be a false sense of security that, 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 that the peak heating season is over. So all these countries, probably including your country are going to continue kind of kicking this, this energy can deficit down the road. But the problem is, is that, you know, fossil fuel is the master resource and there's no, there's no way out of it. <laughs> like there's just no, you know, it doesn't, it's not possible to take enough cold showers and cut back enough to bring consumption anywhere near the realm of what can be fulfilled through any other means, at least not, at least not without, you know, like mega structure type projects that take decades or at least a decade. And so, so like what, what's, what's going to happen? I mean, you know, you know, I mean, if, if you think cost of living is up now, at nine months from now, oh boy, you know what I mean? I mean, we could be looking at five, seven, eight thousand times increase in the cost of, of, of energy and like home and like space heating, you know, next going in the next winter. Okay. So let me tell you what I told a colleague. What do rats do on a sinking ship? Oh geez. What do they do? They fucking jump over and swim. They, they flee. If you're on a sinking ship, you get the fuck out. Um, so I'm going to give you a few suggested destinations where things might be better. Um, Dubai, the UAE. Um, a lot of Brits are already kind of aspiring into that direction um, because they have fewer taxes, well paid. They look after their employees well. Good sunshine, good housing good standard of living, um, relatively crypto-friendly, I might add, as well. Uh, Panama <laughs> yeah. looks so appealing to me. Um, right, so Panama, you, you, are you aware of the bill they recently passed there? Uh, no, actually. I mean, I heard about it, but I don't know the details. So the rough details are that they're recognizing cryptocurrency as a formal asset class, so you can oh, actually okay. It's le legal tender now? Not quite legal tender, but there's no capital gains tax on Interesting. The, um, trading crypto or realizing crypto. And you can set up companies that are involved in cryptocurrency there legally now. So that's a huge plus. Um, I guess in that way, it joins sort of El Salvador in terms of legalizing Bitcoin, although El Salvador has other issues. Um, but Panama definitely has a lot going for it. So it's just made itself infinitely more attractive. Um, Interesting. I, I look at countries, so Sri Lanka, awful example in, in the short term sense, because they're pretty much broke. Um, they've run out of foreign currency, but you know, a part of me fantasizes about buying up land in the desert and building giant solar farms. Uh, and then, you know, on top of those solar farms, 
building data centers and getting some ASICs. So whenever the electricity is not being sold locally, which might be the case if they don't have foreign currency reserves of any value, then you know at least you can sell data center access for cloud networks or staking F or use ASIC miners for Bitcoin, which will get you a nice guaranteed indirect foreign reserve. So I feel like there is opportunity for those who are willing to explore and think and perhaps move further afield. There is opportunity. Um, but I don't really know what the state of play here is. All I can say is I work here as a doctor in the NHS and I see a very bad state of play that I think will get worse when the reality hits people hard and it will, and it looks poised to over the next 12 months. And I think I understand human behavior and I kind of, I hope I'm wrong, but you know, I generally have, a, a, I don't know, I hope I'm wrong, that's all. But I, the, the, the problem is, you know, when you live in the UK, when you are in a role, you kind of get boxed into it. And for mm. a lot of people, for a lot of people like, you can progress within a role, but social mobility within the UK, once you've kind of defined yourself into a role, it's it's not very flexible. Um, I think that's what a lot of people find. Um, but I think, I think if I'm offering practical advice at an individual level, I would say focus on your education and focus on business opportunities. And I'd say probably focus on renewable technologies and farming. Yes. Yeah, I would certainly <clears throat> on self-sufficiency and on self-sustainability and on minimizing expenses, whatever you can. I don't have the answers here. Um, you know, I, I can just tell you what's going through my head. <sighs> well, now is probably a good time for us to uh, talk about starting a... Um, <clears throat> it's probably a good time to start to talk about starting a new a new rice farm. <laughs> Ah, that would be, that's such a Sri Lankan thing to do. I'm thinking about well, where, where, well, where would you do it? Well, so I, I would definitely do it in the, in, in the U S probably. Um, yeah. there's not as much ideal climate here for it, but you know, I've been keeping track of this stuff for a long time and most of the most productive rice fields in the world are slowly becoming, um, contaminated with heavy metal, heavy metals. And mm. it's because the world just cannot resist using, um, you know, um, really poor quality fertilizers. You know, in the case of America and in China, they're using what they call chicken scratch. And it's the it's the scrapings from the floor of large factory chicken houses. And so it's mostly feathers and chicken shit, that kind of thing. Um, but due to the type of feed that they feed these chickens, um, it, it accumulates, you know, you know, the inside this chicken scratch at the bottom of these chicken houses, it accrues a lot of, you know, heavy metal toxins, in particular lead, um, lead, well, lead and arsenic. Um, and so when you use this material, which contains lead lead and arsenic but in particular arsenic and you keep applying it over and over and over again as a cheap as a cheap fertilizer for your rice fields you slowly poison the ground and there's not really an easy way to get arsenic out of the soil um or certainly not a cost effective way to do it <clears throat> and so consequently the level of you know arsenic and rice has been going up for like the past 30 years it's now to the point where people like me are kind of really freaking sketched out by it and um there's a cottage industry that's been growing for the past decade where if you're if you if you um, really want to buy rice. And by the way, brown rice is worse because brown rice contains the bran and the bran contains a higher amount of the arsenic. And so just, just simply eating white rice, not brown rice doesn't necessarily, um, it gives you a little bit of, of protection, but, but, you know, it's still, it's still, it's still in both. And so any anyway, long story short, you know, as far, as far back as six or eight years ago, when I first first started really caring about this, I was actually able to find very small boutique rice farms um, domestically here in the States. And the average value they were getting per pound was, you know, three to five times more than what you could get by going and buying it at the store. And so 
people that like rice, like me, I like rice, um, you know, are willing to pay, you know, sometimes five X to try to get rice that is from a small farm that never spent 30 years poisoning their soil. And this is really the same at, you know, you know, and this is just rice. This is just one tiny example. Another big example would be, well, I guess what's going to happen to pretty much almost all, you know, large farming in the world with, um, the price of urea and, and fertilizers being as high as it is right now, many farmers for the first time and maybe their professional farming career are actually trying to cut back radically on the amount of fertilizer they're using. But the problem is, is that due to the way that factory farming has kind of taken over our food supply, we've basically been practicing less farming and more outdoor hydroponics, if that makes any sense. And we've been breeding these crops to basically exist on as little as little nu nutrients and as little fertilizer as they can possibly um, um, as they can possibly survive on to grow. And the soil they've been growing on, at least here in the United States, has been depleted since probably like 1930. And so the soil is pretty much mostly, you know, it's very inert. There's very little, you know, living ecosystem inside of it. It doesn't contain hardly any of the trace minerals or the trace compound, compounds the soil used to have. And the plants just basically are using the soil for a little more than a place to hold the roots and hold the plant up while they just drench it in fossil fuel uh, fertilizers. And the plants look big, but they're not as nutritious as, the, as they used to be. They're not as healthy. And long story short, we're getting, re we're getting ready to have a rude awakening the next two or three years because the with these farmers trying to cut back radically on the amount of fertilizer, because fertilizer is up 14 times um, um, it's just, you know, its price last year um, um, for this year, uh, mostly just due to supply chain issues and the fact that uh, Russia and Ukraine were like 40% of the global fertilizers, fertilizer supply. Um, we're in a situation now where everyone is getting ready to realize that a healthy, you know, a healthy soil ecosystem uh, and a healthy environment to grow food is not something that you can really replace, uh, you know, quickly. And so I think that getting into agriculture of any kind is a very good idea, um, but it's also really expensive by farmland. So we're in like a chicken and egg, a chicken versus the egg situation here. And yeah, anyone with a little bit of capital, I think would be well, you know, would do well for themselves to figure out how to decide to become a farmer. Because I think in America, the average age of the average, average farmer is I think 60. <laughs> um, um, and yeah, like we all got to eat, right? So it's going to get, it's going to get weird. So, so hold fire. Firstly, fertilizer prices have gone up 14 fold, 14 X. Uh, I'm going to look it up right now. Um, but also average age of farmers in the U S is 60. It's 57.5. Okay. Which is crazy by the way. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> um, okay. We are really black. I have learned that black pill phrase from you. I have been black pilling hard this episode. Normally I'm like all peppy and bright and uplifting, but I have just basically had the I feel like all of the world events have been a bit shit and external to me. Perhaps my chronic back pain is starting to play up again, but that's because oh, no. I'm not active and bummed out. And why have I been? Oh God, Twitter. But yes, are you getting the fact? Is it really 14 X? Because well, I can't okay, here wait. we go. Here we go. So I'm just I'm pulling Passed up onto the consumer. I'm pulling up a chart right now and do 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 do. So, you know, when I picked Another Day in Paradise, I was thinking of the Phil Collins song because Phil Collins is the greatest, but I just didn't realize how appropriate this title was going to be today. Well, so check this out. So I'm looking at the five-year chart on urea, uh, the value of one metric ton of urea, and urea is like the primary constituent for most. You know, there's a lot of that in your piss, right? Yes, a lot I know, which is why you should be putting it in the garden. Um, yeah. And anyway, so the in May of 2020, the average value per metric ton of urea was around 180 US dollars. Oh, okay. And the current price right now is 900. Metric ton. Yeah. So um, here's my thoughts, right? 
nine hundred dollars for a metric ton how big is that container like in terms of dimensions um i'm guessing it's like a little bit bigger than a meter square a little bit bigger than a meter square yeah so a metric ton a meter square okay so here's my thoughts communal piss pots yep no we need we have to do this <laughs> this is not optional yeah. I mean, literally, you could literally have like a crowdsourced communal piss pot. Everyone who contributes gets a tut cut of like what's sold over. There's a shit ton of urea in your piss. So, okay. Um, Just have an open tanker. Let it like, you know, let it evaporate partially. The urea will still settle to the bottom. You can lose some of that water weight, fill it with more urea. So Seems I'm getting like ready to um, do something fun. It's going to get quoted back at me at some point. When no, no, no. These no, no, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take this. I'm going to run with this. Here we go. So, um, All right. most people don't know that I'm actually writing a book on homesteading. And so I've been writing it for probably three months now. I'm only a hundred pages in, but that's actually pretty good progress for me. And I wrote a, a whole little section on um, urine and how valuable it, how valuable it is. And it's funny because um, this has been known for a long time among the kind of you know more hardcore back to the land survival crowd. However, um, to kind of put it into perspective, I um, did a I wrote a little you know, a little two pages on urine and how valuable it is as a like agricultural product. Now this has been known for a long time. Um, in fact, there's even many cultures that still actually, you know, it's actually valuable to save um, urine and feces to reuse inside of agriculture <clears throat> um, before it was being treated or post-processed in some giant, you know, facility. Uh, anyway, and so I will read a tiny excerpt from my book, um, which I think will we everyone will will find being will find fun so here we go let's see here do, 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 do. okay here we go so do, do, do. I'm just going to, I'm going to read this one paragraph. We all pee several times a day. Usually I have learned to call this liquid gold, not for its color or its incredible ability to add nutrients to the soil. The average MPK ratio of urine is 11 one 2.5. Um, <clears throat> one quart or liter of urine contains 10 grams of nitrogen, two grams of potassium, one gram of phosphorus, along, along with various other various other nutrients to put this in another to put this in another perspective a single day's worth of urine can be enough nitrogen for a three foot by three foot square section of soil for an entire growing season this is incredible to show just how nature recycles everything depending upon who you ask some say urine comes comes about as close as is possible to be to being a complete soil fertilizer containing various quantities of nearly all the nutrients the soil needs for healthy plants in one year in one year, if you can collect and save the majority of your urine at home, you will accrue four kilograms of pure nitrogen, half a kilogram of pure phosphorus, 110 grams of calcium, 1.2 kilograms of potassium, half a gram of sulfur, and 50 grams of magnesium. And um, I go on to say that the street value of that is non-trivial. It's like over $100 worth of like agricultural um you know you know product there <laughs> for the gigantic rise in price of this stuff by the way yeah oh yeah yes this is written before the stuff was worth okay. you know so you know a fortune probably not the value okay yeah right um and i find it really interesting that if you actually take this kind of crude formula and and assume so that... just just to summarize at this moment in time there's potentially a thousand dollars worth of piss that you can produce in a year. Um, I would say, like at like the current price today, it's probably between you know, I mean, depending upon you know, you know, if you're selling it at the cheapest price that uh, uh, that a, that an industrial user would buy it for, no. But for the price yeah. that someone would go to the store and purchase, you know, fertilizer product for their garden, yes. Okay. Sorry, that 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 is valuable. <laughs> And I'm glad I know that now. And carry on. And I, I want to point out that that you know the 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 general rule would be you know roughly one day's worth of worth of human you know you know human human liquid waste is the equivalent to about one square meter of of fertilization for one year, you know, or for one entire growing season. Ironically, this translates to being um, 
um, roughly equivalent through normal, not even particularly aggressive or particularly um, exotic means of growing food, it kind of translates roughly to being you produce about as much fertilizer as is required to fertilize as much ground as it would take to feed you entirely from the same ground. See, that's awesome. Kind of funny. That is a feat. Kind of funny how that works, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty fucking awesome. I'm glad I know that now. Thank you for telling me that because yep. uh, I sometimes feel like modern society makes you just forget how natural these feedback loops are yep. by distorting them through a commercialization process. You are separated from yourself. Correct. Through the commercialization of these products. But actually, when you learn facts like these it brings you much closer to the reality that you are what you eat. Correct. <laughs> and, you know, it, it even gets more crazy. And there are, there are even other people that think that um, if you are actually using your own, you know, your own bodily waste products to fertilize the area that you are eating your food from, the, that, and that symbiotic relationship between you and the plants will actually course correct for imbalances or deficiencies in your own diet. Yeah, and that kind of makes sense. So a lot of plants have symbiotic relationships anyway. So legumes, they, they're symbiotes in terms of how they interact with, with their environment. They produce nitrogen, for example. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm, that, that, yeah that, that, that to me makes sense in principle because ultimately you are – kind of interacting with and encouraging biodiversity. Yeah. So, you know, so, so for example, if you had, if you didn't have as, as much magnesium or zinc in your system as you should, and so therefore your waste products are, are deficient in that, the plants are going to work harder to go find that from the earth, from the earth that they're mm -hmm. growing in. And then you will subsequently months later eat those plants that went and extracted that from the environment. And yeah, it's like, it's like a multi, it's like a multi-year positive feedback loop, all seeking to keep everything in balance. And it, may, it makes sense. Like those plants amongst that species, they will sort of adapt as it were. Yeah. They're like the concept of natural selection over time, species will adapt and evolve to seek out and acquire the things they need. So that, that makes perfect sense to me. So, like, so I think the takeaway here is that, is that if, if humans can get the fuck out of the way and we can stop sabotaging ourselves, it may be possible that we can restore, you know, some semblance of order and balance to our lives and to the world. If we can quit fighting, you know, I guess, quit fighting whatever we're whatever we really seem to be fighting because it seems as if ourselves we're fighting ourselves it seems to me that that almost every almost every decision that can be made that's the worst imaginable decision about the future of anything seems to be consistently the only decision that lawmakers are capable of making and this does not seem to be unique to any one country yeah yeah sorry i'm thinking about what's been going on in the States lately. So, yeah. Um, right. Can we move on? Yes. Because, yeah, I want to move on. Because if I dwell on that any further, what you just said, <laughs> it will send me into a spiral. Ooh, fun news. I have continued talking to that person on Twitter, uh, WhatsApp, whatever. But that person is continuing to show me DeFi liquidity mining solutions, which is unfortunate. I wish that person would just... Is this the scammer? Me. I'm not convinced that that person's a scammer, um, but I don't know anymore. I don't know. It's a long story, and I feel we'll, maybe in a week's time we'll cover that, and I'll have a better understanding of exactly where I stand and feel on that. Um, it's interesting, dude. Um, I'm I'm not convinced that person is a scammer, uh, although the circumstances were odd in that when I was hyperactive on Twitter for a brief period, probably a couple of weeks back, I got hit up by four different people who were asking me about crypto, um, and three of them wound up. Well, actually, no, two of them wound up trying to push 
similar solutions. So it kind of is a bit, and also, you know, uh, I got a letter saying someone had attempted sort of to do identity theft and take out credit in my name. Oh God. So yeah, yeah, I know it's, it's, it's weird how lots of these events time, I'm not sure they're necessarily connected. I think some of it's just incidental, but anyway, the thing I wanted to move on to was Elon Musk basically rules Twitter. How does that make you feel, man? Um, I'm, I'm pretty much all for it. Um, you know, like I don't, I don't, how do, how do I say this briefly? I don't really trust anyone to have my best interest in mind. And I don't really trust anyone, especially celebrities to, um, you know, have the most clairvoyant view in my opinion of what, of what the world needs. However, um, Mr. 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 Musk does, does say a lot of, a lot of relatively decent things, uh, about, you know, the nature of, of free speech and, you know, in, you know, light is the best disinfectant and things like that. I'm all about it. I'm actually very, I have, I have a very cautious, I have a very minimal and cautiously optimistic, um, perspective for what will happen with Twitter. Um, you know, I, part of me thinks that it was a waste of time and energy for, 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 for Musk to purchase it. But at the same time, for the past decade, I've seen just how influential that platform is, despite the fact that only something like 6% of Americans even have a Twitter, have, have a Twitter account. So it seems to be, it seems to me that it really kind of is the de facto public commons. Um, and it seemed, it also seemed to me that a very, very small minority of people have an outsized um, ability to influence that platform. And so uh, the fact that it might, the fact that, so, okay, if, you know, if, if the purchase officially happens, which it looks like it's going to, because if it didn't happen, I think that all of the Twitter shareholders would have sued, would have sued the, sued all the, all the board, sued the board for everything they had. Um, if, if it does go private and the algorithms are open sourced, that will make me incredibly happy. And so supposedly that's what is going to be said to happen. And the thing is, is I've learned in the past, you know, 15 years or so, never, n n not to bet on, not to bet against Musk. And, you know, I mean, yeah, he's, he's one to five years late on every, on every timeline that, 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 that he tells the world. However, um, the crazy bastards land in rockets and the crazy bastard pushed, you know, battery technology to a new, you know, you know what I mean? Like, just don't bet against yeah. him. You, you can't bet yeah. against him. And so. Uh, I, I kind of see him as someone who pushes things when the time is right. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's one of those things where I've listened to quite a bit of speeches that Musk has given all the way, all was from all the way back long before he was landing rockets, before he got the NASA contract, before Tesla was even off the ground. And, um, you know, I know that a lot of people get hung up on like egocentrism and the guy's personality, but the reality is, is that if you have been kind of paying attention as long as I have, uh, Musk has been incredibly consistent with, with, with what I perceive to be his worldview and also incredibly consistent with what, with what, um, you know, he's been putting his money where his mouth is for a very, very, very long time. And, you know, he, something happened and he is saying now that, you know, I mean, you know, it, it used to be, he tried to stay away from, from all these debates and try to stay away from all this stuff. And, you know, his whole thing was just clarify what his worldview is, at least, you know, your understanding of it. Um, well, I mean, he is. See, he, he he's almost obsessively he is obsessively driven with trying to get humanity past the great filter right and so sorry the great filter being great filter being whatever else, whatever has caused all other intelligent civilizations in, in in the universe to presumably not exceed the level of technological prowess that we have as as a species now and so 
either 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 we're the first intelligent species in this part of the universe, uh, which kind of blows my mind, or we're the only ones that have, or we're the only we're the only ones that have not yet destroyed themselves, right? And so um, Musk is just abhorred at the idea of humans kind of. You know, like we 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 slowly evolved on you know you know a mid um, you know on a mid African plane, um, and we slowly, you know, we 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 climbed down from the trees or, or wherever, and we started running around looking for food on the ground. Once we found en found enough food on the ground, we started looking at the horizon. Once we started looking at the horizon, we started looking at the sky, and once we started looking at the sky, we started opening our minds to. Um, you know, this kind of grander world. And what Musk, in my opinion, is, is afraid of is humans, like, you know, we, we, we had this like, incredible period of, 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 you know, two or 300 years of incredible scientific progress, exploration, and like prosperity of spirit and philosophy. And now what's happening is that due to our own our own, you know, evolutionary processes being used against us, usually for commercial profit, we're now starting to regress and start looking back down at the ground again. And so whether it be our phones or, you know, humans are, you know, you know, whether it be our phones or we're hungry for food again or whatever. Um, and the thought, you know, the, 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 you know, Musk has said a hundred times, like, like the, the window, the window to the stars may be open for a very, very, very short period of time. And I agree with that a hundred percent. You know, we don't know how so long. He's afraid that we'll become victims of our own hubris. Yes. Like we don't, we, right now the opportunity exists for, for, you know, us to build rockets that are just barely capable of, of moving just barely enough material off the planet with which to use to restart civilization somewhere else. And this appears to be true for the first time in human history. And we don't know. I mean, just, just look at, look at the world right now. All it would take would be a bit more turmoil and a bit more supply chain distribution, you know, you know, problems. And it could ground, it could ground Musk's rockets, for example. So anyway, Musk wants to see a multi-planetary, you know, a, a future where humans are multiplanetary and wants to see that because he wants to know that the future for his children that he has like what, six now or whatever, um, is going to be one that ha is rife with opportunity and promise, even if things are still hard, which things will definitely still be hard. And so if you've been paying attention all along, I mean, people don't understand, like he went to try to buy a, a decommissioned, um, nuclear missile from Russia before he even founded SpaceX. And his plan was to send an intercontinental ballistic missile that he purchased from Russia with a tiny, tiny, tiny greenhouse, like a, like a, like a little tiny greenhouse um, to the surface of Mars and have a, have a live video feed film a seed growing inside of like a little terrarium on the surface of, of Mars. Like that was the original plan to kind of like kickstart like human, you know, you know, humanity's, you know, passion for, for getting, for getting off, off this planet. And, you know, but, but that quickly became, you know, you know, he got laughed at by Ross Cosmos and they said, we're not going to sell you a rocket. We're not, you know, they didn't take him seriously. And now he's out competing their entire space industry. So anyway, long story short, for whatever reason, something happened in the past few years and Musk clearly has now begun to include protecting the public commons, protecting free speech, or at least I hope so, um, as being also now an existential crisis that threatens humanity as much as perhaps technological or like philosophical stagnation. And, you know, it looks like, you know, it looks like he's attempting to join the culture war, uh, not, not as an active participant of any particular side, but attempting to become an arbiter of neutrality. And if, you know, if this works and if he does what he wants, then I think it's probably going to be a really positive thing because I spent the past, you know, five to seven years watching, you know, watching Twitter turn into just basically nothing but a, you know, controlled opposition cesspit of a very, of a very small spectrum of political or philosophical or philosophical ideas. And so, um, 
series of echo chambers. Correct. Yeah. So it was the echo, yeah. echo chamber of echo chambers. And, um, you know, th th there, there were entire, there were entire like schools of thought that you couldn't even discuss on there. And so if, if Musk outsources the algorithms in, and open sources them, I mean, then we're going to, I mean, one, I would love to see, I would love to see the censorship, you know, laid bare um, in the code, but not only that, if the if the algorithms are open sourced, then everyone will be everyone will be on the same playing field. Now, granted, you know, just because it's open source doesn't mean they won't be um, gameable or hackable. They the most certainly will be. To, you know, people that have any experience with crypto know that you know any system can be exploited. So it's going to be interesting, but I'm quite optimistic that this is going to be a good thing you know, long-term, but, you know, it might take a long time and who knows what kind of pressure or what kind of institutional resistance there's going to be inside that company to whatever Musk wants to do. But I mean, you know, it, it, the, 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 there's a phrase in, re, the, you know, the, there's a phrase in home ownership that I think rings true. And that is that if you like the view, you buy it. And so, you know, it looks like it looks like Elon's putting his money where his mouth is. And I mean, this was not even even for one of the richest people on the planet, an acquisition like this was a massive fiscal undertaking. And so, you know, if you watch that TED talk he did just a couple of days after after his offer was accepted, he said straight he said straight to a to a big room full of people. You know, I think this is important. This is not an economic. This is this is not like an economic decision or he didn't care about the econ economic ramifications. So. Yeah, go get it, buddy. Like, go get it, Elon. I mean, I hope, I just, I, I hope, I hope he does what he says he's going to do. I really hope so too. Um, thank you for that. Because I really didn't understand the construct, the, 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 what's the word, context for that. Um, I mean, all I had access to was some headlines and people commenting, but actually it's just nice to kind of get your perspective. It seems a bit more informed and it looks like a perspective that's been accrued over observation over a pretty extended period of time. Um, the reason I kind of brought it up was because a thought had crossed my mind. I think I tweeted, I was, I have started using Twitter a bit more. I think, I think it's not a bad platform actually. Uh, I may, I may slate it from time to time, but um, it does allow you to have conversations with people, random conversations. I think it's good at facilitating that. I think one question I put out there was uh, when people say they want free speech, what they really mean is they want their version of free speech. Yeah. But actually, kind of going a layer deeper, I'm not sure a medium like Twitter is even really capable of free speech just by virtue of having a 150 character limit on its tweets. Um, I think the very nature of that platform is designed to distort or isn't necessarily deliberately designed to do this, but I think it can quite easily distort the meaning of any intended message by forcing a user to conform to its particular format. Yeah. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure that Twitter really is, is a free speech pro platform and ever going to be. And I think people who think it is might be potentially misguided in some sense. Um, but it is a good platform for communicating messages. It is a good platform for encouraging discussions and people getting people to connect. I mean, um, I, I kind of agree. I, I kind of agree that it probably is the de facto public square, or it's at least it's at least one. It's one software platform out of maybe a dozen that I think in you know <clears throat> all combined make up the quote unquote modern public square. And I mean, it. I, I'm one of the last people to in the world to, to say, you know, you know, more regulation is the solution, but it is, it is weird that, that, you know, I don't know. It, it's, there's gotta be some ways as, as a society, we can come up with some kind of structure that we all collectively agree as imperfect as it is, is something that's meant for, you know, protecting everyone's ability to, to have, to, you know, you know, to, to basically, basically putting everyone, everyone's, you know, you know, right to, you know, believe and say what they say, whatever they want. Um, but also do it 
in a way that is like relatively egalitarian. <laughs> and I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what yeah. makes the most sense. I mean, you know, t typically, I, I don't think that's, yeah, yeah. I mean, typically in a public square, whoever has allowed, whoever has the loudest megaphone is the one that you usually hear the most, but at least everyone can go there and have a shot, you know, as it is right now on all these platforms, um, only, you know, specific demographics and specific, you know, ideologies are the ones that get to say anything at all. And I just, that's not good. Yeah. I, I, I kind of, I veer towards agreeing with you that I just think the very concept of free speech, it's, it's a, it's a difficult one to truly provide a platform to enable that for everyone in every way possible. And I personally veer towards being like what I consider a free speech absolutist, which is, I think everyone should just say whatever the fuck they want. Yeah. I don't really try and get offend unless someone is going out of their way to try and offend me. I don't really get offended. By I mean, even, even say. then, even if they are going out of their way, um, you know, yeah. like it's, it, it it takes two to tango right and so yeah. so now granted i mean you know i've got a pretty thick skin but if somebody comes at me really hard eventually they're going to get under my skin i mean i think it's i think it's human nature but it's up it's kind of my responsibility to recognize that that point exists and to try to you know mm. dip out of you know you know you know you know dip out of the crosshairs i think before it gets to that point Ooh. So the, the position I've now evolved into is if I feel someone's deliberately kind of come at me, I try and understand their worldview and their history. I try and kind of empathize with them first. And then if I can kind of, if I can, this is a really hard thing. If I can see where they're coming from, it's a lot harder for me to get mad at them. And I think that's generally true. Like yeah. I, I think the last Twitter I'm going to call it Twitter argument, but it was really a debate and it was actually really just two people having two very different conversations. I think this one guy, Scott C, he basically put some question about, you know, things you change. And I basically put the, this idea about 50% of shares like, should be, you know, of corporations should have 50% of their shares held by their employees. And he said, well, that's called socialism. And then I replied and said, the word socialism in the context you're using is very reductionistic and it's not. And then he said, define why. And then I went in a long rant. And then what I could see as this discussion progressed is that we were coming from it from very two different perspectives. So in my mind, during this debate, and it's worth looking it up on, on, on Twitter because it's still there. Um, in my mind, a corporation, in his, I could see that in his mind, if he set up a business then he is the corporation. But in my mind, the corporation is the corporation. It's not the person who built it. It's just its own thing. And that's actually how it's legally recognized. The corporation's recognized as an entity that's separate of any individual that founds it. So to me, it's like, well, if you're going to have it constitutionally that 50% of, of shares in a, in a co company should divvied up by their MPs, well, you know, it, it's not socialism in the sense that you're not doing forced wealth distribution because the corporation still holds 100% of its capital in shares. It's just the distribution mechanic. Whereas to him, it's like, I am the company. <laughs> I, therefore, it's all mine and I should be able to do with it as I please. Like, okay, we clearly are coming. And then also, you know, I realize that he doesn't come from my world, which is like, 10 years of emergency medicine, seeing people from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, being able to understand that not everyone has the circumstances to be lucky enough to be where I am in my life. You know, that lots of people who are self-made, you know, you know, six, seven, eight, you know, digit net worth figures, figures or more, um, you know, a lot of the time, you know, especially the ones who are more self-aware, they're aware of all the incidental, fortunate or lucky circumstances that helped get them to where they needed to go. I certainly am. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't get to where through just sheer grit and effort. I had key breaks along the way. Um, so I, I just feel like we were having two different conversations. And I kind of realized that as we progressed into this discussion, but he didn't. Mm. And I noticed that he was becoming a lot more emotional, a lot more defensive. 
And then his last thing he said to me is, well, why don't you give 50% of your personal wealth to charity, at, you know, to random people? I was like, well, that's not what I argued. And I just told him, look, if you want to argue this in bad faith, that's on you. Um, but you can't ask an open question without expecting responses that you don't want to hear. So if you want free speech, if you truly believe in that, then you really have to be prepared to listen to and engage with the opinions of people who potentially disagree with you or have a different perspective. Uh, and if you don't want that, then don't ask open questions. I, I, well, if you don't want that, then don't be surprised when you ask open questions that you're going to get hurt or upset. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So we are coming up on an hour and a half. So yeah. I think there's more you wanted to cover. So let's try let, let, Let's try to do like a blitz round and, and wrap everything else up right. because I think that clouds are going to roll in at my place in about an hour. And boy, I would love to get a tiny drop of sunshine on my face before oh, dude, I listen, lose the sun. Let, let me interrupt. I'm done. <laughs> I've got to drive in an hour's time. <laughs> Well, what are we going to so talk about next week? Um, I want to see where this little thing goes with these, you know, these, you know the, the conversations I've been having in the background. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of good news about, uh, you know, Scan for Change, yes. the thing we discussed. Yep. Right. So the Particle team have agreed to develop the proof of concept script for oh, QR wow. codes. For okay. The discussion yesterday, it when we sat down and worked out, I was like, yeah, use... Just, just do this for the part blockchain. So hopefully we can run a few events, you know, in the upcoming future where this script is in play and attached to clothing articles or artwork or whatever, and then show this works. And then we can maybe move that forward. Um, there's a few other interesting things. I know I've helped kind of in the background. Um, we kind of have, not directly with AR Weave, but kind of, We've partnered up with a project that's funded by AR Weave. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. Or we've kind of come to a kind of informal agreement to help support them. And then, as you know, there's been plenty of, firstly, 3.2s on Testnet. So that's pretty awesome. Private messaging, that's awesome. And then I think I had some sort of brief discussions with CryptoGuard. It looks like things are progressing really nicely. That's awesome. That's um, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So I feel quite positive actually um you know i know this is another day in paradise and we started off on this like doom pill black pill yada yada and we kind of went 360 on all of this in the end uh i think we found like shades of hope in all of this and there are there are definitely shades um, of hope and i think they're always in technology by the way man i like like you said i think it's it's our commitment to technology that will always push us through and i think a lot of the stuff that we're seeing is simply i like to think of politics and governance models as being legacy technologies the current ones that we see yeah. and i think they're pretty much being pushed to their limits and like their failure points and exposure points and exploit points are pretty much being drawn out and shown out so i think we'll see like the new technologies evolve and new systems and structures evolve that will you know, be better, more efficient, more productive, uh, be more sustainable. And I think we'll see those things kind of seep into life more, but I think it'll take time. I agree. I agree. Right. It's been a pleasure as always. I don't know what we're going to talk about next week. I will figure it out. <laughs> we're going to figure it out. But anyway, um, next time i probably won't be quite so foggy headed but i think i think i did okay considering i've got you know rona on the brain but you did uh, brilliant a thousand dollars of piss a year yeah roughly yeah yeah it's kind of it's kind of incredible isn't it retail value <laughs> my god <laughs> it's kind of incredible um okay well with that i i'm going to i'm going i'm going to dip out of here and uh, it's beautiful here it's going to be I think it's around 20 degrees outside Celsius and it's sunny. It feels like one of those days of spring. And I just hope that the, the, the biting flies are not here yet because they're coming and the biting flies where I live are really bad for like two weeks out of the year. And if they're here today, I'm going to get hurt when I go outside. 
Hey, quick favor. When you finish your book, can you send me oh, a copy? Oh, of course. It's going it's to be a while, though. I wanted to finish it, you know, in the spring, but that's not that didn't happen. Oh, cool. Uh, please do. And, and could you send me a copy with a photo of you smiling with a ridiculous face? Uh, that would be really cool. Okay, I'll do that later. Okay, fine. <laughs> Dude, it's been a pleasure, man. I will catch you. Enjoy the fields. All right. See you, everybody.